Good morning, brothers and sisters in Carlos and Satya. This is the second week of 2021. I wish everyone a blessed and happy new year and hope that uh, this new year will be a better one. And I believe all of us will pray for a better year that the COVID-19 in Malaysia will be put under control. So let us continue to pray that our government will have wisdom and uh, taking necessary steps to put COVID-19 under control. And we pray that also the vaccine will be able to help us coming to 021. Let us come to the Lord in prayer before we look at, we look into His Word. Our gracious and mighty Lord, we thank You for Your Word. This morning, even as we study of Your Word, Father, we pray, God, that we will not only gain intellectual benefits from your word, but your word will speak to us, penetrate into our heart, that will cause us to understand and know you, our Lord, our Creator, our Savior, know your character more, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, and that our love for you will continue to grow, that we can walk with you in a closer way. We pray, Lord, that you will speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, before I share the Word of God with you, I want to share this place of tourist attraction in Germany, Berlin. Uh, thank God that a few years back, uh, we had the opportunity to visit Berlin, and this is one of the uh, uh, attractions that we went and uh, indeed it is uh, an unforgettable uh, place that we have been. Why? Because this is a memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. So inside this, underneath this ground, there is a museum that you will find all the real videos and photos of how the Nazis, Hitler, murdered millions of people in Europe especially the Jews. So if you are planning for a trip to Berlin, make sure that this is your last spot that you want to go. Otherwise, it will spoil your mood for the rest of your trip in Berlin. Yeah, so as we know that, <coughs> and as many of us know through the history of, uh, through studying history in our school, that now after years of Nazis rule in Germany during the, no, Hitler's final solution was to was known as the Holocaust. That means to eliminate all the Jews, killing them all. You know, uh, especially in the concentration camps in Poland. Now, during this process, approximately six million Jews and some five million others, targeted racial or political reasons, died in the Holocaust. More than one million of those who perished were children. So can you imagine human that can carry out such brutal, inhumane violence toward, towards others? Now, but throughout human history, our world has been full of such things happening even today. We have governments and officials who have committed atrocities against others either due to political power or religion's matter, like ISIS. Do these people believe that God will judge nations who have committed such inhumane crimes? We might also ask, how does God view such inhumane violence? The text we will look at today will be able to answer such questions. Now, as we look into the scripture now, I hope that all of us will prepare our Bible up front now and turn to Amos chapter 1. Because I won't be reading the whole passage for us this morning. Uh, I hope that you will follow through and uh, as we look at the Word of God. Now, recalling Dr. Carl's sermon last week focused on the introduction of the book of Amos. We know that Amos' ministry is in the northern kingdom of Israel, particularly to the elite group. Elite group means the wealthy 
or an influential group of people and not in Judah, Amos' hometown. Now, the elite offer, you know, the, the elite were group of people that were hyper religious, you know, they attended worship services, they offer joys, you know, joyfully tithes and sacrifices, and they long for the day of the Lord. However, their religious zeal was only superficial and corrupted by oppressions, pride, paganism, and politics. Therefore, the purpose of the book of Amos was to exhort the elite group of the northern kingdom of Israel to repent of their oppression and injustice, the arrogance and complacency and religious corruptions, and turn back to Yahweh in order to live righteously for him. Now Amos announced the war oracles against the nations in chapter 1 verse 3 to chapter 2 verse 16, which describes the sin and punishments of eight nations. It can be divided into two parts, six oracles against the foreign nations from chapter 1 verse 3 to chapter 2 verse 3, and two final oracles against Judah and Israel from chapter 2 verses 4 to 16. Those two nations are the Hebrew nations. Yeah. Today we will only focus on the oracle against the foreign nations. As we study, as we begin with Amos first oracles against the foreign nations, let us ask ourselves one question. Why did Amos bother of telling the Israelites about the sins of other nations? Now, since his audience we know, you know, was to the elite group of Israel, but we know that these oracles fit together as a well-planned rhetorical argument aimed to change the Israelites' view of their future relations with God against and, war and warning them against the sin. <coughs> This is the division I have split out for this uh, today's message, Judgment on Israel's Neighbors. So we have uh, six part that will be the six oracles that Amos announced. So Amos begins by claiming to declare the word of, the, of Yahweh. Now this is what the Lord says, or in King James Bible it says like this, Thus says the Lord. Now, Amos' first announcement of judgment is against Damascus, the leading city of Syria. If you refer to the map I display here, they occupied the territory to the northern of Israel. Aram is another name for Syria, and Kerr as well. The rebellious act of Syrians that Amos mentioned is not dated, we don't know when. But it is probably happened, it probably happened years earlier. It could happen when Hazael took the Israelites' territory around Ramon Gilead in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 28 to 29, and 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 32 to 33, or when Ben Hadad conquered Jehoahaz in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 to 7. Amos uses metaphorical statements saying they trashed Gideon with slashes of iron teeth. Threshing planks was a process of beating the wheat to separate the grain from the shaft. The graphic imaginary represents most inhumane and harsh way of treating people made in the image of God. The judgment made against Gideon is described as a first as as the fire and destruction of war, the falling of Damascus, the death of the leaders and exile. Hazael was the founder of the dynasty that ruled over Syria and Ben-Hadad that mentioned here in the scripture was the current ruler. The valley of Ava means valley of wickedness and ben beth Adams means house of pleasure. The punishments and Amos announces involve destruction of the king's house and military fortresses that given him security and protection. 
with the defeat of the king and his army, the fall of the surrounding city-states like Ben Eden is sure. Those captured in the defeat of Syria will go exile into Kerr, the place where Arameans, Syrians came from. We can find that in Amos chapter 9 verse 7. The Israelites hearing upon Amos' message will certainly have said, Hooray! They deserve these charges and they will definitely approve what Amos is saying to them. Second oracles against Felicia from verse 6 to 8. Amos' second announcement of judgment is against Gaza. Gaza was one of the five leading cities in Philistine's nation. The Philistines kept occupied the territory to the southwest of Israel along the Mediterranean coast north of the Egyptian border. Philistia had been the enemy of Israel from the time the Israelites had occupied the land of Canaan. The Philist Philistines' rebellious acts against God involves capturing whole communities for slave trade. This slave trade set gangs, gangs of armed thugs against defenseless rural villagers who had no one to protect them. These innocent people are deprived of all rights and sold to the highest bidders. The desires for wealth has, for these Philistines has led them to dismiss the basic value of human dignity for every person. Felicia's punishment is similar to Cyrus. God will cause four out of the five cities, Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Ekron to fall. The final end of Philistines will be complete eradic eradication. Amos again end his second oracle with a reminder that this is the message of the Lord for Felicia. And surely his audience, the Israelites, will agree to what Amos had proclaimed. Third oracle against Phoenicia from verses 9 to 10. God has spoken again, I must say. Tyre, the leading city of Phoenicia, located on the small island off the coast of Mediterranean Sea. Their sin seems to be familiar to the crimes of the Felicia, of Felicia dealing with trafficking of slaves. The difference between Tyre and Felicia is that Tyre is only accused of selling whole communities not capturing them. This could mean that Tyre may, be function, may have functioned as a middleman, brokering capture people from various nations to the highest bidder and particularly to the Edomites. The punishment statement is brief, but the point is clear. God will go into action against the people of Tyre, bring down the thick walls of the city and cause its strong Fortified palace fortresses to be up in flame. The Israelites cannot be more than agree to what Amos has just proclaimed again, I, I, I presume. Now, fourth oracles against the Edomites. Verse 11 and 12. Amos, Amos fourth, fourth oracles is against Edomites. These people were related to the Israelites. Esau, Esau, the father of the Edomites, was Jacob's brother. You can find that from uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 1 to 26. Edom's rebellion against God involves chasing his brother with sword, having no compassion and exhibiting contentious attitude of rage towards the Israelites. The people that the Edomites have slashed out against are not specified, but since Edom is situated, is situated east and south of the Dead Sea, which you can find in the map, its evil deeds are probably committed against Judeans from Amos' home country and not the Israelites. The punishment statements are brief and devastating announcements of God's intention to end the terror of that Edom has unleashed on its neighbors. 
The key cities, Timan and Bosra, are targeted for destruction, thus removing the Edomites' prime military and economic power. The Israelites, hearing Amos' message, will definitely say yes, they have deserved it. Fifth oracle of judgment is against Ammon. Ammon was also a nation of distant ancestors of the Israelites. According to Genesis chapter 19, verses 30 to 38, the Ammonites were the descendants of Lot. Ammon became an enemy of Israel during the time of David. You can find it in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 31. The Ammonites have carried out military campaigns to take control of Gilead on the east side of Jordan, but it process in, and in the process of doing that, they slaughtered innocent and defenseless pregnant women. Can you imagine that? The slaughter and savage act is described as cold-blooded murder. These acts have terrorized the people living in Gilead, causing them to leave the area so that the Ammonites can expand their borders. God's judgment on the Ammon involves the destruction of the capital Rabbah and the military fortress in it. Ammon Amos, Amos foresees a great battle and a great slaughter of the Ammonites. It will be like a great storm, an image frequently associated with the Theophany when God himself appears on the day of the Lord to execute his wrath upon mankind. The king and the officials responsible for Ammon's military policies will go into exile. Certainly, Ammon's audience also wholeheartedly approve of God's word about Ammon. Six is the oracles against Moab. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. The last foreign nations mentioned in this Moab, the sister nation of Ammon. The Moabites live just south of Ammon and north of Edom, the east side of the Dead Sea. Second King chapter 3 may provide the historical background of not for understanding the, understanding the sin of Moab. Their willful rebellious act has been the burn uh, has been to burn the bones of the king of Edom. This desecration of the buried bones of a royal figure was bad enough, but the Moabites have gone one step further by using the king's remains as lime. Now, this actually, what does it mean by lime? Possibly as a plaster on the wall of the house, like plaster ceiling. So they use the ashes of the Moabite or the Edom the king of Edom, after they kill him, they use the bones burn up and as lime on the house. That is unbelievable. This was an act of total disrespect for the dead in the ancient Near Eastern world. God's judgment of Moab is similar to what will happen to Ammon. The military fortress is a carrier we also has, you know, also, their temples for Chemosh, their god will be burned with fire. So Chemosh is their god, something like that. So God will defeat the Moabites in a great battle together with their ruler and officials. Lastly, and again, Amos audience will say, yes, that's a wonderful proclamation from the Lord. Now, after reading all this, punishments towards the neighboring countries of Israel, I think most of us will say, oh, this is not nothing to do with us today. May, it's not that this is not, there is nothing to do with us. We can have a great lesson from this passage. Now, earlier I asked the question, what is the purpose of having the Israelites agree that these foreign nations should be punished? Amos is not just concerned about what will happen to the foreign countries. 
He is trying to persuade his audience that the same principles will apply to every sinful nation and even more for those who have special special relationship with Yahweh. The next two oracles will be against God's chosen nations, Judah and Israel, who are equally sinful as the neighboring nations. If Amos is going to convince his Israelite audience to change their own perspective, you know, to change their own oppressive and violent behavior in his next announcement, he must make the audience agree that God is going to destroy all who committed such sin. Adding to that, God will punish them for their rebellious act as God's chosen people who are bound with covenants with the Lord. We must be thinking that wow, Amos was preaching like the Apostle Paul in Athens when Paul talked about the unknown gods to the, you know, to the, to the people in Greece. You can find it in Acts chapter 17. I'm sure that the Spirit of the Lord is the one who guides Amos with wisdom to establish this basic theological agreement with his audience so that he can use the force of these arguments when he begins to talk about the sins of the Israelites. What can we learn from this? Amos proclaimed God's word with clarity, but he was not just preaching. Instead, he wanted to change the way people think about their own relationship with God. It will not be easy to convince people that God will judge them, so he carefully planned his sermon. In our church settings today, pastors and church leaders are called to preach God's word with clarity and hoping that the congregation will examine their relationship with God. We need to know how to relate the message to the group of audience in order that they can understand and agree with the word of God. What then if you are not a preacher in the church? Know that all believers are called to proclaim the good news and it's never easy to tell people that if they do not accept Jesus as the Savior, they will go to hell. It's the truth. But at the same time, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us how we can relate our message with the result that it changes the lives of our hearers. The fact that God knows exactly what each nation has done and in, is involved with their history shows that He is the Lord of all nations. The Israelites might restrict God's work and concern for his chosen people Israel and ignore the rest of it. Yet God reveals himself to Amos as the one who controls all nations. God holds all nations accountable for the act of inhumanity and in, to any individuals, whether kings, presidents, prime ministers or military generals, or other with political economic power that have tremendous responsibility to use their powers wisely in order uh, and with equality. In Amos' speech, God holds six nations responsible for the barbarous treatment of defenseless people, but Amos never mentioned what laws have been broken since they are not part of the Hebrew nations that know the law of Moses. However, in Romans chapter 2 verse 12 to 16 tells us that no one has an excuse before God. Those who do not specifically know the law of God will be judged based on, based on what they do know because it, because it has been written on their hearts as human beings made in the image of God. They have a conscience that warns them about wrong behavior, social law, social law, and <coughs> that governs the proper way to treat others in, so in the society. 
Human beings have freedom to choose to do what is legally or socially ethical towards one another. Therefore, all corrupted governments and officials will have to give an account to Yakrit. Perverted humans' values are not exempted from, the, from responsibility and will not escape God's hand of justice. However, this is not the end because God can forgive if a nation is willing to repent. Like the story of Nineveh in the book of Jonah is a good example. Today, God provided us with a better way to escape God's wrath if one is willing to repent. Jesus came as a sinless human being, took upon our sins by dying on a cross for our sins. And not, not only for the Jews, but for all over the world, for all the nations, for every tongue, every nation. That's why uh, many of these uh, old Chinese thinking, they always think that Christian is for the Western world, not for Chinese. Actually, it is not. That's why we have to educate them that this God died for the whole world. As believers who have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus, not the blood of Jesus Christ, how should we respond to seeing nations and governments practicing this act of inhumanity to other human beings? Now, lately we heard from the local news that in 2021, this year, only a few days passed, alone at least two motorcyclists died after hitting the port holes involving an elderly man and a grab food delivery. Every, every year there, are, there were at least 100 deaths of motorists caused by port holes, if you are not aware, you know, and uh, which was not made public in the media. However, a few weeks ago, some port holes were quickly repaired after the same politician caught an accident while riding his bicycle. I think you know what I, who I'm talking about. Now this is a good example when government and officials is practicing double standard and as a this is the result of corruption. Hence, such irresponsible act should also remind Christians of why we always stand against bribing and receiving of bribes. Such practices causes extreme poverty and many will suffer that we don't we, we are not aware of. Now another example is the adoptions of pastors in our countries. You know, like the government don't care and the authorities don't bother to open further investigations into such crimes. These are the injustices we see in our own country. But if we are attentive to the news around the world today, same things or even worse tragedies are happening all over the world. For example, in India, thousands of female babies are killed each year because families value male children following the ancient Indian tradition. Does God care about such injustice and inhumanity acts? I believe that the answer is yes, and God cares more than any of us, especially when His children are being mistreated. We just have to continue to trust and obey His commands, to love and even to love our enemies, because only Yahweh has the ultimate authority to bring judgment upon the sins of this world. I want to make a conclusion here, finally, that the world belongs to Yahweh and He will proclaim His judgment against all governments and officials and individuals who abuses their power and authority towards other human beings that are made in the image of God. And God will not relent until we repent of our sins and turn to Jesus Christ whom through his suffering and death took upon himself the wrath of God. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. 
Almighty Lord, we thank you for your word that warns us that even though you are a loving, gracious, and merciful God, but you are holy, O oh God. You are righteous and you cannot tolerate sins and you will punish sins one day for nations, governments that have acted violently towards the people that they have created. Father, let us be able to take this message with the reminding with the, with the reminder that Lord we need to honor you each day and Lord we need to trust in you and not take things into our own hands. Believe that God only you have the right to act and to act justly in your own timing. We thank you for your message this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, wish everyone a good week ahead. May the peace, joy, and the fellowship of our Lord be with each and every one of us. God bless.